right, good evening, everyone. I'm Cindy Passmore. I'm the former chair of the graduate group in education, one of the two sponsors of the Distinguished Educational Thinkers series, and I'm here um, on behalf of Nicole Kurlander, who is the current chair of the group, to introduce the introduction. Um, <laughs> Uh, the speaker series is something that the School of Education and the Graduate Group of Education have sponsored now for several years, quite a number of years, bringing in some of the best and brightest thinkers in education to share with us their thoughts. Um, and each person who comes in has a faculty sponsor, and this time it is my pleasure to introduce Heidi Ballard, who will introduce our speaker this evening. Thank you all for coming. Avoid the stairs and go for it. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm so honored to be able to introduce Dr. Angela Calabrese Barton. And um, I thought I would just tell you a tiny little bit about her before she kind of goes deep into one of her projects. Um, so she's a professor of science education at the Department of Teacher Education at Michigan State University and has been there for about 10 years, and before that, for about 10 years, was at Teachers College at Columbia. Um, I first met Dr. Calabrese Barton at my first NARST conference, uh, the National Association for Research and Science Teaching. Um, uh, but I think an important memorable experience for me was quite a few years later, uh, being a part of a workshop that she pulled together um, at the, at a, of about 20 people at a community science workshop in San Francisco, where she brought together the most amazing group of people working with youth in informal science education settings to talk about equity, first and foremost. And these were people that work in museums, people that work in these small local workshops, where kids come to, and the room was filled with all this stuff, that it turns out is very important for science learning, all kinds of tinkering and making and um, things like that, and, um, and some education researchers. And so the goal was to talk about equity in science education. And the, in the room there were a lot of positive stories about young people who had navigated obstacles to take up science for themselves um, and use it on their own terms. But there were also a lot of stories of youth feel, feeling powerless or unable to overcome those obstacles. So the key thing about that is that it was researchers and practitioners in the room grappling with that together, um, explicitly focusing on equity in science education. And equity wasn't an afterthought, it was central. And practitioners weren't in a fishbowl or on a panel, but were um, you know, explicitly co-creating and co-learning researchers and uh, practitioners together. So the room was grounded in practice and it was everybody's practice. And that's the kind of engaged scholarship, the research, the R, and P, R plus P, the research plus practice, collaborative research, however you want to call it, that I think is what Dr. Calabrese Barton is transforming the way people think about science education. Um, she does that by taking deep looks at STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math learning, and practice with critical theory, bridging those areas in a way that I think not too many people are doing. Um, and uh, to do this, as I said, she dives really deep into, it means long, deep engagement with youth in the places they live and go to school and tinker and play. And it means working over years and years with after-school educators and teachers who, I can't believe the number of years, with after-school educators and teachers who work with those youth, listening and learning um, from their experiences and triumphs and struggles. She's also was the editor of the top science education journal in the world, Journal of Research and Science Teaching, for about five years. Um, she's authored books and co-authored books titled things like Teaching Science for Social Justice and Democratic Science Teaching, Building, to ex Building the Expertise to Empower Low-Income Minority Youth in Science. Um, and currently, she is a W.T. Grant Foundation Distinguished Fellow for 2015-17. And the title of that project that she's working on right now, I just wanted to make sure, because I know there might be some people in the audience interested, um, 
the, the makerspace movement, sites of possibilities for promoting equitable opportunities to learn and pursue STEM among underrepresented youth. So, she'll be at the Exploratorium for a few days after this. Um, so, I, it is truly my pleasure to welcome Dr. Calabase Barton, and I'm so look forward to looking, lear learning from her tonight, and I'm sure we all will. Thank you. All right, so thank you, Heidi, Dr. Ballard, for that uh, wonderful introduction, and Dr. Passmore for the introduction of the introduction. <laughs> and um, so what I want to do today is to focus on how do youth imagine pathways towards becoming in STEM, and in particular towards becoming, as you can see in this title here, community STEM experts. And I use this term imagine to capture, as Bull might say, the places where expectations can become dissettled, generating new practices grounded in the world as it is now and in the world as it could be. And I take the stance in, in saying that, and also across my talk today, that youth are co-designers of their own trajectories and futures within in STEM. And we have a responsibility to learn alongside them to figure out exactly what that means. So community STEM expert, this term is not one that I created on my own. It actually originated from the youth with whom I work. And I use this term because it's theirs. And it captures a way of being in the world and in STEM that position youth with the agency to know, to do, and to be in ways that both value who they are and what they bring to the STEM table. I also think it captures what we hope for all of our students, indeed all of our citizenry, as scientifically literate people. As Janice, there in the picture, an 11-year-old stated, a community STEM expert is someone who does things that are good for the community because of what we know. We know a lot of science, and we also know a lot about our community. Who else can put these ideas together? So to help contextualize this point, before I delve into the specifics of my talk, I want to tell you a story about fall. And um, I want to share this brief story about fall because I think it's an interesting story with which to initially think about this point of community STEM expert. Fall right now is currently a 10th grader, but I first met her um, in the fifth grade at the Boys and Girls Club. And over the last five years, fall has shifted from not having any particular interest or disinterest in STEM, just sort of it is what it is, to in eighth grade thinking that she wanted to work in a green hair salon, to now in 10th grade considering a possible future in engineering. All the while, Fall has struggled with being labeled as, quote, as her seventh grade teacher said, a girl in the background. Or someone who her mother described as, quote, if she would just get D's, I would be happy. And while she's had an IEP all throughout school and has been a struggling reader, this past year in 10th grade, she's established herself as a, quote, STEM blogger extraordinaire with readers of her blog from all around the country. And as part of a larger study, we interviewed Fall over time to ask about what are her pivotal moments in her own STEM pathway. And she mapped out seven key experiences, which you'll see here. But I want to talk about one very briefly right now that of the Little Free STEM Library. So Fall and her friend over five months conceptualized, designed, and built a Little Free STEM Library at the Boys and Girls Club. So let me just quick show of hands, how many of you are familiar with the Little Free Library movement? Okay, so most people in the room. So she and her friend had to research Little Free Libraries, um, styles and wood types, determine size requirements for this library, then she drew up blueprints by hand, and then she redrew them up in a um, 3D sketching program. She cut and assembled the wood. Later, she and her friend decided to add a door to protect what was inside their library and a lighting system powered by a hand crank generator, which in her words would be fun for kids to do and would get them curious, uh, curious enough to come over and look and see what was inside the library. When Fall talked about this um, library, she, felt, she talked about how access to STEM books would be really important to help kids practice their reading, an area that she struggled with. 
but it would also help them to learn science in case they weren't getting science in school. But in addition to books, she also wanted to put in her little free STEM library mini maker kits for kids to take home so that they could, quote, make the things that she had a chance to make at the club. She describes designing and building this little free STEM library as one of the things she's worked on the hardest ever and one of the things that she's most proud of. Her blog posts kept during the time, and here's one of them. You can go to getcity.org to see some of her blog posts. Um, her blog posts during this time remind the reader of how hard she's worked, how important access to STEM is, how important the library is, and how much others appreciate her work. And fall STEM knowledge was crucial in building this little free STEM library in order to even imagine its possibility, to construct it with an alternative light source to keep it and how she would power it, and in her design of the paper circuit kits that she put inside of it. Her knowledge of community was also essential um, to even set up the idea that this was something needed in her community and where it should go, its location at the Boys and Girls Club, and what she should populate this library with so that kids could, quote, get to where she's gotten. Fall describes these experiences as pivotal because she could use science to solve actual problems that kids have. And for her, being an expert meant more than just knowing something, although that was important. It also meant learning what she needed to know, teaching her community, and doing things to make a difference. She said it helped people to see her as a girl who worked hard, a girl who was smart, a girl who could get things done. So Falls Becoming in STEM is about so much more than these actions I've just described and about so much more than the seven pivotal experiences you saw on the previous slide. Her teachers, both in school and after school, her family and her peers, all played important roles in opening up and foreclosing her potential pathways into STEM. We have to also remember that her work takes place against a socio-historical backdrop, whereas a white girl growing up in multi-generational poverty, she's positioned both with and without power. Fall's story urges us to develop more robust understandings of how, when, and why youth seek to become in STEM in equitably consequential ways and supports that they need along the way as they do so. And so I ask these questions that I'll attempt to answer tonight. How do youth imagine and author new pathways towards becoming in STEM, and in particular, towards becoming community STEM experts? What ideas and practices do youth take up while engaged in STEM across the spaces of their lives? And in what ways do youth practices inscribe their spaces of doing STEM with possibilities for becoming experts in STEM with the agency to make a difference in their lives? So I want to back up for a moment and set the stage from a research standpoint, examining crucial intersecting problem spaces that frame access, opportunity, and engagement in STEM. And so there in the center, first, I think we absolutely must acknowledge what Ladson Billing refers to as the education debt. She argues that focusing on the achievement gap between students of color and white students, while very real, is misplaced attention and also deficit-oriented. The education debt instead focuses on attention, focuses attention on the outcomes of accumulated historical, sociopolitical, economic, and moral policies impacting communities of color who've long been marginalized and inadequately served in education. Inequitable access to resources, school funding, quality teachers, instruction, role models, cultural barriers, and stereotypes, and the list could go on. The long-term education debt has substantial consequences for broadening participation in STEM, and we have to see the problem space that way. Just some examples. Lower-income communities of color experience the greatest levels of environmental injustice with the least voice in STEM-related decisions affecting their communities. We need to look no farther than Flint, Michigan, my own backyard, to see this lived reality played out now in the moment. And yet, Equitable opportunities for meaningful engagement and success in STEM affects opportunities for empowered democratic participation. Or, many students of color in the U.S. are succeeding in STEM in school science, 
that's not what it, the dominant narrative is, but, it, but we have to remember that even when many youth of color are succeeding in STEM, they're still not, cho they're choosing not to pursue STEM as careers because they're not feeling welcomed in the STEM community and they're not being recognized for the assets that they're bringing to the STEM table. And again, equitable opportunities to engage in STEM and, and to be recognized for what you bring to the STEM table opens up viable routes to personal and community economic advancement, but in equally important ways can transform the field of STEM itself so that it is more welcoming. We see the realities of the education debt playing out time and again in the stories that youth tell us. Take James, for example, who suggests that having a perfect grade in math, a 4.0, is a secret that he wants nobody else to know about for fear that he'll be bullied by his peers. Take Bostas, who's worried that teachers will not see her as scientific just because she's cool and fun. School is boring because I can't be me. My teachers only see what I can't do. Or take Kathy. Kathy notes that she feels like an imposter because she doesn't have the proto prototypical experiences her STEM peers have, such as science camps and family lineages in STEM. She says, quote, it makes me feel like an imposter to call my pathway a STEM pathway. These stories remind us, or should remind us, how youth from low income and communities of color are unfairly positioned as non-experts and outsiders to science and engineering. How people are positioned and by whom, because of what they know and who they are, shape opportunities to learn and become. And so I take a critical socio-cultural view of learning, where I see learning and becoming is taking shape dialectically in practice. And I refer to this dialectic between learning and becoming as identity work. Identity work focuses analytic attention on how authoring oneself in STEM always takes place in the moment, where the ways in which people figure themselves and are figured are related to what they know and can do, such as disciplinary knowledge and practice, as well as one's own funds of knowledge, how they use that knowledge to take action in their lives in meaningful ways, and how they're recognized um, by others for such. These moments, though, are shaped by both local and broader cultural narratives, such as disciplinary narratives. What does it mean to be scientific? Education narratives. What does it mean to be a good science student in this classroom? And the answers to both of those narratives are not always the same. Or cultural narratives. What does it mean to be a girl? What does it mean to be a boy? What does it mean to, be, uh, to grow up white or to grow up African American and so forth? And so while identity work takes place in the moment, it also projects across scales of activity, including time scales, or the real virtual and imagined spaces of one's life or the vertical and horizontal dimensions of learning. And for me, this is where the possibility of thinking about identity work being transformative resides. For example, in the moment actions and how those get made sense of can reshape how one reads what has happened to them into the past and how one projects into the future. Or how a person's actions get recognized by others for being scientific or not can open up or foreclose opportunities for others, both in the moment and again over time. So identity work is an equitable view of learn and becoming because it shifts the focus from fixing the individual to remediating and transforming the system as individuals interact through practice. And so, with this framing in mind and those research questions as a jumping off point, I want to use the rest of my time to unpack three main claims, which I think respond to those questions. First, becoming a community science expert is one form of identity work that's equitably consequential, transforming the boundaries of participation in STEM in the moment and over time. Second, STEM practices of CSEs are rooted in community and reflect deep and critical knowledge of the needs communities face. And third, as youth engage in rooted STEM practices over time, in the moment actions serve as critical pivot points for deeper learning and becoming in STEM. To unpack these claims in the remainder of my talk, I'll share with you stories of youth engaging in STEM in community. These stories, which are shared as stories to think with about these main claims, and the larger data sets in which these claims are grounded, emerge from these three projects here. 
Get City, which was an eye test project and involved cross-city partnerships in support of tech-rich investigations. Club to School, which is a multi-sided um, ethnography of identity work of girls across the middle grades in four cities. And Making for Change, which is a current ASL project focused on participatory design of equity-oriented makerspaces. Each of these projects leverages multi-sided critical ethnography and participatory approaches, allowing us to spend hundreds of hours with the youth um, to learn with them across settings, home, school, community, after school, and over time, primarily between the fifth and ninth grades. And I'm happy to delve more into the specifics, uh, specifics of these projects at questions, if you would like. So let's now look at this first main claim. And to do so, I'm going to share you an in-depth story of Quan. And I share Quan's story in part because he, he asked me to. I've known Quan since he was in the fifth grade, and collaboratively, we've compiled a comprehensive um, case of his experiences in and out of school. Last year in the ninth grade, um, he combed through those data, and he wrote his STEM story for a chapter which is now published in a book by Rutledge. And he begins this chapter um, by reminding the reader that as an African-American young man, he's constantly confronted with stereotypes. As he says, quote, I heard from my teacher that African-Americans are less smart than whites in science and engineering. I was not surprised to hear those stereotypes from my teachers. I hear them all the time, no matter where I go. There are many negative racial stereotypes in the movies and on TV. African-Americans are not smart in science on TV. They are never the scientists on the show. They're trying to make the show funny, but really, it's a stereotype. So the first um, slide here in Quan's story is a letter that Quan wrote to his fifth grade teacher six months into the school year. <clears throat> so think about it. He's been in a self-contained classroom since September. He wrote this letter in January. And he states in the first paragraph, this is your student Quan, the first one in the second row. This should remind us just how much many youth feel marginal and even invisible in science class. If we look at the third paragraph, this points to the creative ways that he is engaging in science at home and in the community that he wants his teacher to know about. I do things out of school and out of Get City that involve science. I went door to door and asked adults if they use CFL lights. The majority of adults did not use CFL lights. I will try to decrease the amount of people who use incandescent lights. I did it on Wainwright Ave. I did it because people's bills are up. In the last paragraph, though, he reminds us and he reminds his teacher that his success requires others to recognize and value his efforts. As he says, it's not so much for energy that I get attention at school, but for being funny. I'm recognized for that, for being a smart aleck but I think that should be good. So then, okay, let's go to move on to sixth grade. So in sixth grade, Quan produced a 60-second public service announcement as part of his work in Get City. He wanted to make ideas around energy consumption and its connections to climate change accessible and salient to members of his community so that they could both save money and help the environment. I'm going to show you the video in a second. But what I want to point out is that later in the school year, he, so he made this in an after school program, he decided he wanted to bring this video into school to show his teacher. Because as he said, it's the movie that changed how people thought of me. Mainly, I was excited to show my teacher because he saw that I could do it, that I got it done, and that I know a lot. So let's watch the video.
All right, so you know, it's important to note that at the time that Quan shared this video with his teacher, when we were visit him in school, we often found him sitting outside of the classroom in the hallway for having been sent outside of class for clowning around. Quan felt this punishment was unfair as he didn't think he was clowning around, he was just a funny person. So later in the summer, when Quan was participating in a summer program at the local university. Quan noticed that the stairwell in the education building was overly hot. And so he had finished some of his work early, and so he took it upon himself to investigate how hot it was and what might be the causes for that heat. And he ended up making a four minute video um, providing evidence of how hot it was and explanations for what impact he thought it was having on, his, on the local university and on planet Earth. And he asked us to send that video to the person in charge of the building so that they would understand what was going on and fix things. So we did. And before I tell you what happened, I'm going to show you a 50 second clip from it. So, the university positively responded to the video and actually took immediate action to solve the problem. Got in the email response, um, the engineer for the building said, quote, the students are correct that sterols do have an issue with solar gain in the summer, and it looks like there was a mechanical problem with the heating valve leaking. And what's interesting to me is that the heater had been malfunctioning for months prior to Quan's action, and nobody, myself included, had done anything about it. So he says, quote, being recognized by other people makes me feel like I've accomplished something. At school, my teachers now know that I'm a science person. At MSU, I feel like I'm known for being smart and helping save energy. I feel that I did more than other college students that walk through that hallway every day. And he's right. All right, so that was the summer after sixth grade, so now let's go to seventh grade. Um, at the end of seventh grade, Quan learned about a statewide contest for entrepreneurs through one of his friends at school. And so, on his own time, he borrowed a computer and conceptualized a youth-centered video game to teach about climate change. In an interview at that time, um, he said this about his game. I wanted to create a video game that teaches other kids about climate change. One game that I like and that lots of other kids like is Grand Theft Auto. This game's about taking missions from masters and completing them. It's kind of violent, but it's fun. It's popular. I like taking missions. So my climate change game would be like this, but it would not be violent. The missions would be about doing things to help CO2 from not building up. Each mission, you have to know more or learn more about the causes and effects of climate change. So Quan's grand climate change game engages his community members in broad environmental issues related to the everyday practices of lighting and driving, as you can see in both Mission 1 and Mission 2. And yet at the same time, he's deeply aware of the precarious nature of these practices for the people in his community. Electric cars are expensive, so are CFLs. Somebody's economic livelihood might be in selling incandescent light bulbs. These concerns are a part of his game. Grand Climate Change supports his community in developing their own local understandings and arguments regarding climate change and human behavior. As he wrote in his game description, you have to think of all the reasons why somebody might care. You need to think about the strategy because the more angles you hit, the better you do. 
So in authoring this game, Kwan had to synthesize information from various domains, including um, community and peer culture, video gaming culture, video gaming infrastructure, and content understandings about the different issues salient to climate change in order to make the game accessible to those in his community. So there's several other events I could tell you about Quan's story, but I won't for the sake of time. But his story does help us, or me anyway, to unpack this first main claim, <laughs> that identity work as a community STEM expert is equitably consequential, transforming the boundaries of participation in STEM in the moment and over time. As Quan said, I never imagined that I could have a job in STEM. However, I began to change my mind about my future. I look back at it now and I think, wow, I really have done a lot. I made a difference in how people think about climate change and their actions. So by equitably consequential, I suggest that identity work is forward directed and transformative for both the self and the community. Acts of learning and becoming contribute to and help to legitimize an ever-expanding range of ideas, tools, resources, and ways of being in STEM. Quan leverages his humor, his community activism, his care for his community, his care for Earth as forms of capital with which to engage in STEM and with which to make STEM accessible and salient to members of his community. Yet Kwan was often in trouble for his humor and just simply unrecognized for his care at school. This should not be surprising, although it should be disturbing, given the socio-historical narrative that unfairly positions young black males who clown around as deviant in school settings. Yet Kwan was still strategic in how he used his humor and his care to disrupt both these local and historical practices, at least in the moment, in order to author a chance to engage in STEM and to be recognized for his efforts. It would be a mistake to think that Kwan could transform the system on his own or that even his small in the moment disruptions undo the systemic racism that he experiences as he tries to engage in STEM. This is for me where the whole grit, grit metaphor breaks down. Youth need allies in this process across spaces and over time who help push back against all aspects of the education debt. When the en energy engineer at the local university, an ally, took Kwan's movie seriously and wrote a memo describing the needed repairs based initially on his investigation, she positioned him as scientifically powerful and important. When post-its were placed on the broken vents, literally by the end of the day, to indicate that repairs were in progress, Kwan's actions were further made public to the community. When Kwan's teacher took his video seriously and then showed it to other teachers in his school to talk about what they might be missing with this young man, he opened up new dialogue in new spaces on youth becoming in STEM. Each time allies broker connections with or for youth across these potentially deep chasms, they help to break down marginalizing boundary, binaries, such as insider, outsider, expert, non-expert, successful, unsuccessful, making access to STEM potentially equitably consequential. They can help to rewrite our understandings of actions in the moment and how we project them onto what we think we know and the understandings of possibilities for futures in STEM. So now I want to shift my attention to these other two claims to look more closely at STEM work that youth do, to make sense of the ways in which the STEM practices of CSEs are rooted in community. And to do so, I'm going to tell you two more stories of youth that I have um, known over the course of um, three years, although this right here shows their work over two years. The first is a story about Samuel, an 11-year-old who joined his Makerspace Club in the middle of sixth grade. And that's him in the upper left-hand corner and bottom left-hand corner. And he joined <clears throat> the Makerspace because he just kept seeing what other kids were doing, and he wanted a chance to do something like that, too. And so... I'm going to talk a little bit about how Samuel designed a light-up football while working in his makerspace two to three days a week over the course of about five months. So his light-up football, so get a picture of this, a football, has LED tube lights that wrap around the ball that provide maximum lighting with minimal added weight, friction, or power expenditures. And because the lighting was so efficient, it didn't burn the little hands that were using the football. The lights are powered with rechargeable batteries um, that are, can be recharged at an external solar docking station. 
limiting environmental impact and saving money. The football itself is constructed from Nerf material to further minimize added weight and to reduce the possibility of injury if one were to be hit in the head. And the batteries are stored in a pocket at the center of the ball, accessible by a small door to keep it weighted properly and to minimize their potential contact with rain, water, or sweat. So what I'm going to do right now is show you a two-minute clip from a longer movie that Samuel made about his football. Why did you decide to make the light of football? show more of the video later if you want. So this idea for a light up football grew out of Samuel's desire to make something that would be helpful to people in his community. As he states, I really care about people and I could do stuff in the community. Some kids really don't play football, don't have no friends and stuff, so I go find people to help out a little bit. But Samuel's idea of care is nested in his understandings of the needs that young people in his community face. Few streetlights in his neighborhood work. Football is a positive peer activity that can help you make friends and keep you out of trouble. Most families cannot afford expensive toys. As Samuel noted in his interview, his light up football was an idea that he thought and thought and thought about for months while home at his grandmother's house, unable to find transportation to the club, nor able to play outside after dark. And Samuel was proud of his efforts as he stated, quote, I was really proud because it just made me feel good about myself so I could like acknowledge people what I could do. However, a light up football presented Samuel with many challenges of both technical and social consequence. I'll talk about only one for the sake of time, how lighting a football requires power. As Samuel noted, powering the lights costs money. His solution was to use rechargeable batteries because it saves money and time. Mine's rechargeable batteries so we can see all the time, but you won't have to keep going back to the store and buying batteries. And rechargeable batteries addressed another concern that he had, environmental sustainability. As he said, make the world greener. When you throw batteries away, those critters can get inside your trash. Like the raccoons can like take your batteries out. But having a football, like a real football, in terms of size, shape, weight, and aerodynamics were the most important, and that really challenged Samuel as he sought to power his ball. As we can see, and I'll just show a little bit of the short clip, two batteries did not light the ball well enough, but more than two batteries made the football too heavy and expensive. So he had to spend a significant portion of time investigating different kinds of lighting systems and their affordances.
All right, so Samuel finally got his lights to work, but then his cousins, Caden and Demarcus, who play for a local community team, complained to him that his ball was too wobbly. As they said, um, I should have made it so the battery would be hanging out, because if it hangs out, it kind of makes it heavier on one side. So when I went back and tried to do it, I made sure that when I cut it, I made sure that it would be deep enough so it won't make it so heavy on one side, so it could be just right, so like a real NFL football. And so Samuel then needed to consider the weight of the football and the location of the weight just to get the ball to work aerodynamically. Eventually, he figured out how to get the batteries at the center of gravity. And then also, I don't know if you noticed it when you saw the movie, how to wedge those LED lights into the ball. So the need to light a football reflects Samuel's experiences in the world and how through his developing STEM knowledge, he was able to engineer in ways that positioned him with agency over the concerns of his life. I'm gonna to return to Samuel's story in a moment, but I'm gonna tell you another quick story about Jennifer and Emily, also sixth graders who designed a heated jacket that would keep their peers warm and also keep them from being bullied. Jennifer joined her after school maker club because she wanted to use the club's computers. She was quite proud of her abilities with technology as she stated on many occasions, I am good at jailbreaking stuff. In fact, sometimes when we needed to get past the firewall at the club because we had to get on YouTube, she was our go-to person. <laughs> Emily joined the club because Jennifer joined and they had been best friends from an early age and she didn't want to hang out at the club in a different space without Jennifer. So from October to May, Jennifer and Emily designed a heated jacket. So let's let them explain their jacket. This is the process of me doing the project. In the process, we learned about heating pads, solar panels, and how to build. All right, so the girls came up with this idea, not like Samuel, who came in after months and months of thinking and knowing what he wanted to make. They didn't actually know what they wanted to make. They ended up spending four weeks surveying peers and community members about the safety issues that they cared about. And from graphs that they made of their survey data, they had got, <coughs> excuse me, 62 responses, they noticed that commuting, <coughs> commuting was a major safety concern, identified by 74% of the respondents. And that when they looked more closely at the open-ended comments um, on this point, they noticed that the youth respondents were more concerned with walking in the dark and bullying as opposed to the adult respondents who are more concerned with car transportation issues. So they decided, based on this information, that they ought to move ahead with a, a heated, lighted jacket. And the girls described this jacket as one that would be, quote, warm, bright, lightweight, and glamorous. But the aesthetics of this jacket carry much deeper meaning than just beauty. The girls were concerned about inappropriate exposure and being bullied for appearances. As Jennifer stated, as she stated, you get made fun of like, why are you wearing that? You're up with your stains on your clothes. Oh, I don't know why that wasn't at the beginning. So anyway, um, she was saying, like, I was going to give you something beautiful with casual in it so you don't expose yourself, like a jacket that goes all the way down and has beautiful light-up things. My idea could change things. People make fun of you. And then you heard her say that. Why are you wearing that? You're ugly. There are stains on your clothes. And so the jacket was meant to push back against these negative peer relations in addition to keeping people warm. So the girls on road into making this jacket was a bit rocky. But their interest in fashion and their comfort with computers got them through another initial rocky phase. Their initial design sketches were full of fashion detail but lacked a lot of technical clarity on where they might start. And so they began their investigation by spending hours, 
hours on Pinterest, where Jennifer had her own page with fashion ideas. And on, they at, made their own new page of Pinterest where they had detailed ideas for the kinds of materials and fashion they wanted. Um, they wanted the word cool spelt across the front, so they looked for lots of things that had that. They wanted a hood, they wanted trim down the zipper. And it needed to be soft, and it definitely could not be bulky. And this is where Pinterest explorations became interesting. Because the, with the extensive amount of time they spent on the internet looking for heated jackets, what they found was that, quote, all the heated jackets are for hunting and construction, not for casual. And they all have those big heating parts, and that would be heavy. So it gave an immediate place to begin to delve into the technical part of the exploration. So the, the girls went in search of different kinds of non-bulky heating pads, different heating elements that they could find around their makerspace. And after testing four different heating pads that were non-bulky and finding the one that they thought would heat their jacket just right, they then need to figure, like, how are they going to power it on the go? Because you can't stand there with your jacket plugged into the wall. And so working with a mentor, um, they conducted a few different experiments and some calculations, but then this ended up also causing enormous frustration for the girls. As Emily stated, I like this heating source, but we can't use 110 batteries. We don't even have that many batteries, and the sweatshirt jacket would be just too heavy. Here is where tapping into community networks played critical roles in helping these girls over this and other hurdles. One of the mentors, when Emily was upset about the power requirements, reminded the two girls of a funny video post that they had made earlier in the year, where Jennifer had told a story about insulation around the fireplace at home that her dad made. Remembering and reminding the girls of this story led the girls to begin to start thinking about insulation and um, thinking about how they might get away with using a smaller heating element if they could find a way to insulate their jacket. As she said about that video blog, that silver lining, as a kid, I seen a lot of it because we had to put it, we had something in our fireplace. We had to put silver lining around it so the heat would stay in. And in another instance when, um, that's Jennifer right there, cut too deeply into the jacket as we saw in the previous video, that actually sent Emily out of the room crying because all that hard work was for naught after this jacket was destroyed. One of their peers thought of the idea of going to get one of the staff members at the club who does a lot of sewing to fix up the clothes to teach them how to use the sewing machine. So it seemed like with each new fa cool fashion idea that the girls came up with led to technical challenges that were complicated and frustrating for them. Another huge one being how to power the jacket with solar energy because in their words, solar panels were ugly. And while I don't have the time to go into the detail of that piece of the story, I'll add that part of the solution resided in using um, the sewing machine to make a cool stitch to get a flexible panel stitched into the jacket. So what can we learn from these two different stories about the football and the jacket? Well, even with the Little Free Library and Quan. First, I think that you know, we can argue that youth STEM practices are rooted in community and are reflections of deep and critical knowledge of the needs communities face. And such rootedness can help youth endure some of the challenges they, they face as they engage in STEM. In our studies, the youth often position themselves inside the urban ecology. Their rooted STEM practices draw on expert knowledge inside to these spaces, such as their funds of knowledge, and their insider positioning status that they have, granting them access to networks that we as teachers or researchers don't always have access to. For example, knowledge over streetlights have historically not worked, who is bullied, the importance of football and positive peer activities, what books or maker kits might help young people, how to work with one hands to build, knowing what staff members know how to use a sewing machine, and on and on, all reflect their insideness their membership and experiences in community spaces that they inhabit. As Samuel stated on the importance of reaching out to his cousins and the football star, quote, I know how to find people who know how to help. How the youth drew upon their insider knowledge and positioning across spaces reflects their efforts to author interconnecting corridors for traversing between these community spaces and their STEM-infused work. But there are nodes of criticality in their rootedness that we have to pay attention to. And such criticality pushes youth to engage more deeply in STEM with a sense of both urgency and hope. 
These include economic, making designs affordable, environmental, supporting local ecologies, social, such as fostering positive peer relations or community ownership or preventing bullying and gang activity, and urban infrastructure, like providing lighting and warmth on cold, dark days, which we have a lot of in Michigan. In addressing these concerns, the youth refused to overlook the complex, multifaceted dimensions of potential solutions as they integrated these concerns into their design work, humanizing what it means to engage in STEM. Each note of criticality pushed the youth to consider new technical factors that had not been previously considered. These domains too, however, importantly challenge stereotypical assumptions about what youth of color care about or what youth from low income communities care about. As one of the youth said, quote, African Americans are stereotyped in the media as people who do not care for, earth, care for the earth. And yet we see that care stretch across all the work that they do. So the second point is that as youth engage in such rooted practices, their in the moment actions serve as pivot points towards deeper engagement in STEM. And here I use Holland's use of the, of the word pivot to refer to mediating or symbolic devices, not just to organize responses, but also to shift into the frame of a different world. Pivots can include tools. These could be conceptual tools, like funds of knowledge. They include relationships, such as Samuel's ties to his peers and cousins. But they also include the innovations themselves, such as the little free STEM library for supporting reading, making, and STEM. And I want to talk just a little bit about the different roles that these pivots play. First, as I've already noted in the stories, the youth leverage their insideness as navigational indicators for launching into STEM work. Their insidedness provided secure directions when the way forward in STEM was unclear. It also gave them directions for where within their social networks they might rely for help. But secondly, Specific community concerns and stakeholder perspectives raised in the moment provided a safe way for youth to be critical of their design efforts, to view their design efforts in critical ways, opening up spaces for them to actually functionally break down their design work into reasonable bits from a technical standpoint. As Fall stated, we need to feel safe when we're learning these things, meaning we need to feel safe when we have to dig into the STEM that we don't understand. And so as community concerns initiated more complex design conditions, the youth had to turn to science to consider the best ways to both maximize trade-offs as they sought to optimize these designs. For example, Samuel switched to Nerf material to reduce the weight and to make cutting into that ball easier. But in talking with his mom, he also realized it introduced an important safety feature. Jennifer and Emily actually dropped the lighting from their um, jacket to prevent additional bulk and power expenditures, but at the same time expanded the types of tests they conducted on the heating systems to attend to more complex understandings of how they wanted the heat to work in their jacket. They added the skin test, the time test, the fabric and the mylar test, and the location test to ensure the intersections of comfort and um, technical success of their design. Fall switched from a solar powered to a hand crank generator when the peers around her convinced her that her library was better kept indoors. So there are many ways that these pivots expanded possibilities for becoming in STEM as well. For example, in their after school club, they positioned engineering as an inside practice and something co-owned by the community. As Samuel walked through the club with his football, kids gathered around him asking him, where could they buy one, and when could they use it? Quan's video game embraced the complexity of his community in building arguments around that relationship between climate change and human behavior and what was possible in their community. But these pivots also transformed the playing fields of STEM, both real and imagined. The youth's practices served as tools to expand the purposes and goals of engaging in science. At the heart of each youth's designs is an effort to work at the intersections of science and the public good as a way to transform both, all while acknowledging and challenging the power boundaries of race, class, and gender. As 
what we see is youth engaged in a process of taking back and reclaiming the space of STEM in ways that recognize and care for their rootedness in community. As Jennifer explained, quote, I feel like it will be super cool. People will love it. They'll say, who made this? It was me. Then they'll ask me, like, the tiny person always in the background did this? I'll say, yeah, I did that. This girl knows how to have fun, how to get down and smart when she really needs to. This girl can be fun. She could build things. She could make the world a different place and help everybody else learn how to have the type of fun she has and stuff. Little kids can do ginormous work. So how do the ways in which youth author themselves as community STEM experts matter? For many youth, gaining access to STEM is a constant uphill battle. Their STEM pathways are not neatly laid out for them, as the term pathway suggests, and their efforts involve accessing ideas and resources and ways of being not traditionally legitimized in STEM education spaces. Many of them have literally had to hack a way forward, sometimes through unclear and unfriendly territory, with the hope that they'll be recognized for what they do. The youth across our studies often work to author these new paths within very small and safe spaces, such as supportive after-school clubs or small peer groups. But they also have to take the risks with the help of allies as they move their ideas and practices from these safe spaces to unknown and potentially unsafe spaces as they try to build a trajectory forward. Youth authored paths, though, I want to make the point, though, that youth authored paths, though, in more than just interest-driven ways. And there's a lot of talk right now within the collected, uh, connected learning movement that we have to think about the ways in which pathways are interest-driven. And I think that's true and important. But the point I want to make here is that while interest matters, so do the ways in which such interests are forged within socio-political histories where issues of power and privilege and location deeply shape identity work as they forged ahead with their lives in STEM. And so I want to close with um, this point that youth need and we must design for multiple on-ramps and tools for hacking new ways of becoming in STEM. Because these are things we can design for in STEM education. I think just in the stories that I've told today, we have good evidence that using the tools of ethnography with youth in their after-school programs enable them to more systematically and deeply leverage their insider knowledge while supporting them more precisely engaging in engineering design. We have evidence that structured opportunities for recognition through multimodal artifact production and sharing of research findings across authentic communities of practice affords increasing opportunities for identity work. We have evidence that tools that support the hope and urgency youth bring to doing STEM in community can recreate more human spaces for learning and becoming in STEM. But to design well, we also need to be open to youth's experiences in the world, STEM and otherwise. And we have to be willing to respond to the educational debt that they have lived across generations. And while we need a plurality of approaches, I hope I've also made a case here for a more central role for youth participatory design work that takes place across setting and over time. We need to be able to see the world from the vantage point of the youth we hope to serve. And they own the right to have their voices a significant part of this process. And so it's on that point that I would like to give the last word to the youth. And so I'll close with a short clip from Samuel three years after he made his football that speaks directly to this point on participatory design and equitably consequential opportunities to become in STEM. Think about teachers. Think about how the teachers is going to help everybody, everybody in the class, in the school, want to do community science. Think about the teachers that can sit there and let us read out the science books. Think about the teachers that barely have hands on the projects before it for our class. We don't know how to do this. We have to go outside of our own time to find places where we can go and learn how to do 
projects and learn how to engineer and build things. And school knows to do that. We need to make sure the school and teachers, is, we got to help them. We got to persuade them to want to work out in the, in the community. We need to tell them how we do it. We need to tell them why we do it. And we need to tell them most of all that helping people is a good thing to do. Helping our community is helping us too. That's not just helping one person, it's helping anybody. So thank you. I guess it's Q&A. Q&A time. Do people have, um, uh, I can do, yeah, sir, please. Um, I'm Dennis Lee. I'm the president of the Pennington. I want to thank you so much for the very presentation. Oh, thank you. I learned a lot, and I wrote something that published this or has been published, so we haven't actually read it. My question is the youth you selected, they're all of them are very smart, very talented, I don't want to say very intelligent because I don't believe in the concept of intelligence in general and it's done for just creating social class. If you read the Belkev uh, book, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, but at the same time they were highly motivated. Mm -hmm. How can we find these kids to be highly motivated to do all these things? Because without motivation, they may not be able to produce that much. Yeah, so, um, so I think one of the things to remember, I'll say remember, but I never even said this to you, so I'll tell you now. <laughs> so the, the programs that I drew these cases from um, take place at uh, community centers where kids go after school every day because that's where you go. There's really no other place to hang out in town. Um, and so they join our after school programs because they're hanging out and then they have nothing to do. Or they're there because their friends are there. We don't, um, you know, self select for kids who have an interest in STEM. So, like you saw with Emily, she was there because her friend was there. Uh, and I'm making that point because these are ordinary, everyday young people who, when given a space to take action on the issues that they care about, have motivation to do something to make a difference. One of the things that Samuel says later on in that interview that I showed at the end is that when you start on a project like this, you have to succeed. You have no choice but to succeed because you owe it to the people in your community who you've committed to help. And so, you know, it, that doesn't mean that on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, when we're at the Boys and Girls Club, they see us at the door and they come running in and start working really hard on their projects. It doesn't really work that way for many of you who've worked in out of school programs. Oh, they come running up and come in because we have great snacks um, and they can get snack and then there's you know social time. But a lot of times, you know, there is lots of deep frustration and kids will leave and then they'll come back. We had this one group that worked on the Timmy, which is a boot. And they, they would work for like 15 minutes and they would just go leave and play basketball because they were like, we're, we're done, we're out of here. But we had an undergrad mentor who was an engineering student who, um, who was working with that group in particular. And he decided after about a week, which I thought was a really smart move on his part, to go to the gym and just start playing basketball with them. And he would, he'd play basketball for 30 minutes till the open court was done. And then he'd coax them back into the room to get them to work just a little bit more on the Timmy. And it took four months, but they got their boot to light up. They got it to work. And having that success, I think, in that moment, then expands opportunities for, or expands understandings of what's possible in that space. So they're willing to come back and maybe try a harder project. Other kids see that success and they want to have it too. So I don't know. I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, in terms of motivation, there's a wide range of different kinds of motivation, but it's partly about how you design that learning environment that supports young people in doing and being in ways that they care about so that they not only feel that their work is legitimized, their work is actually legitimized. Yeah. Um, wonderful talk. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Um, I really like the concept that you um, 
laid out about educational debt mm -hmm. and taking it from just the individual to uh, mm -hmm. more systemic. Um, and I'm wondering if you might draw that concept through mm -hmm. a little bit more since mm -hmm. the examples you gave were wonderfully evocative but mm -hmm. individually based mm -hmm. and didn't quite get at sort of the, mm -hmm. that larger systemic context mm -hmm. that those mm -hmm. experiences were happening and how, how, how you work with that. Okay, yeah, I, I tried. Um, so, um, so one of the things that I think is really important um, to think about across these examples and others in our project is how the practice of engineering is co-owned in community and co-shaped um, within these community spaces. And I think that's a really essential theme because it pushes back on um, power dynamics in terms of who has the authority and the right to be in engineering. And so carrying that across um, not only how we design, you know, we as teachers and researchers design for experiences in that space. So um, for example, adding in the tools of youth as community ethnographers, I think is one way to um, one way to promote dialogue in community to position the engineering um, agenda in that shared space. I think that's one example of how the individual work that kids or groups are doing is part of this broader narrative that pushes back. I think another way in which we see that, and again, this is sort of juxtaposing the individual or the team against a, a broader um, a broader piece is this idea regarding um, what it actually means to engage in STEM in maker spaces or in after school clubs, what kinds of talk can happen, what it means to be in these spaces. Um, so one example that we write about in a different paper that's um, in press right now at Teachers College Record is an example of a group of girls who um, had been worried about issues of rape in their community. And they had done all this research and I have to go back and ask them because I'm not sure if it was tied to a school project or just something that they were doing on their own. But they were deeply worried that, um, that they fit the demographic that where there were the most percentages of rapes in their community. And they viewed being having this opportunity to work in the makerspace as a chance for them to take some action on that topic. But to do that meant that they came into the space and then we're talking about rape, which is a traditionally, I would argue, taboo topic in a STEM classroom. And so, again, thinking about the kinds of pedagogies that we engage in this space, what topics are legitimized, what topics are not, I think is a part of how we think about narratives around what it means to do STEM, what it means to engage STEM, what are the motivations for engaging STEM, and so forth. I don't necessarily think we address issues regarding like structural inequalities, regarding funding, because, well, we do have an NSF grant, but beyond that, we're kind of broke. <laughs> um, and it's really interesting, I think, trying to institute a community-based makerspace in a boys and girls club where they are really strapped for space themselves. Boys and girls clubs across the country offer many different services, but also operate on a shoestring budget themselves. And so we can't necessarily ask for a dedicated space in the club, but we can be given a space that we can consistently use across time. And so it's then, and, and maybe in some ways this does push back against this, because it is strategizing both with youth and collaboratively with staff at the club to how do we make this space feel like our own space? Like what can we keep permanently in this multi-purpose room that doubles as a maker space at times? Where can we store stuff? How can we um, showcase work that young people are doing and transform that larger space of the club even though we're working on a limited budget? So take the Little Free STEM Library, for example, that sits right now at the entryway of the Boys and Girls Club. And it was very strategic on the part of that particular group because they're very aware that um, if you don't have your club membership, which costs, costs $10 a year for youth to be a member of the club, and if you forget your membership card, then you have to pay 25 cents. We can critique that, but that is the reality. And so you can come in and then realize, I forgot my card, I have to leave. But if the little free library is there before the desk, then kids can have access to that. And so again, you know, while this is a project of two young people, 
It's an effort for them to engage broadly with the community that they're a part of as a way to change that space so that there's greater access to um, the tools and resources that one might not have access to in school. It might have sounded like Samuel was critical of his teachers, like, we have to read and we don't have the stuff. But one of the things I clipped out, really only for the sake of time, it's a really interesting talk that he was having with the young woman next to him, Fall, about how teachers care. Teachers care, but their school just doesn't have the stuff for them. Teachers care about our learning, but they don't necessarily care about our communities because they don't, they're not from our communities. They don't live in our communities. And so, um, so I, I think that incorporating this critical dialogue around how young people are positioned by others in society and opening up spaces for them to push back against those positionings, I think is an important part of this as well. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, <clears throat> To me, it's very, very dewy and very contextual for the, the students. Okay. But I'm wondering, what can so I'm I trained also as a vocational teacher, so all of this oh, makes mm -hmm. total sense to me. But I'm wondering, let's say at the middle school or elementary school level, mm -hmm. can what you're finding here be transposed into yeah. those classrooms? Mm -hmm. yep. And what kind of training might be needed? Yep. 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 And what would people yep. need to let go of? Yep. That's a great question, um, and one we're actually trying to tackle right now. We have a DRK-12 from NSF where we're taking some of the approaches that we've used in these out-of-school programs and creating tools to support teachers that would, um, in the context of engineering design challenges, that would support um, the kinds of equitably consequential identity work that I've been talking about today. And these engineering um, challenges are grounded in, um, there's kind of an essence of making that cuts across them, but also grounded in um, an engineering for sustainable communities approach. Because that approach pushes on and asks for co-ownership of the agenda, co-ownership of the design process, co-ownership of the outcomes. And so it's a real challenge though, thinking about what do these teachers' tools look like? How can we co-develop, we're co-developing them with teachers and with young people because they're asking teachers to be in the classroom space in a way that's really different from anything that's been expected of them. We're asking teachers to support young people in engaging in dialogue with community members as a part of what is going on in the classroom. And we're asking teachers to support young people in um, developing designs in response to these design challenges that they can't necessarily predict what they'll be. It's not like everybody's going to make a bridge. It's not like everybody's going to make a dropper that makes you know 30 drops in a minute or whatever but they'll be tackling questions that are co-constructed in dialogue with community and so these um tools that we've generated to support young people in engaging in community as community ethnographers of these out-of-school spaces are a part of what we'll be using with teachers in classrooms. But right now, we're at the phase in that project where we have teachers and young people working together in out-of-school spaces, classroom teachers and young people working together in out-of-school spaces. And the goal is, hopefully by next spring, we'll be fully piloting that in sixth and seventh grade classrooms and schools. So, you know, to be continued, <laughs> I'm a little bit nervous, but excited. Go ahead. Uh, so these are really, I mean, they're interesting mm -hmm. examples and stories. Mm -hmm. And I assume in this after school space, there's 20, 30 kids. Mm -hmm. For whom, for how many of those kids does this not work? How, even mm -hmm. despite your best efforts, you can't engage them. And what is your thinking about why? Yeah, so um, my worry in giving this talk is that um, people would walk away thinking Angie only told the success stories, right? And that's a, that would be a fair critique. Um, but I think that, I think what is really important to think about is what does it mean to be successful in these spaces? And I honestly, I'm gonna get around to answering your question. Um, because one of the things we look at is um, how can we open up this idea of what are important outcomes in the space? 
And so important outcomes include new forms of participation and engagement in STEM that one might not have had before. It might be um, just engaging in playing around with an engineering or STEM identity that one was maybe too afraid to play around with before. Or it might be you know, learning some new content or some science or engineering practices. And so we really try to take a stance that we want to start with young people where they're at and help them to move in as far along as they can. So let's take, for example, this one group, um, Barbara and Philip. And they wanted to make a backpack that lit up, and they wanted to use piezo pads, so um, uh, moving um, vibrational energy to electrical energy to get it to light up. And they got really frustrated and Philip stopped coming. Uh, Barbara kept coming. And piezo pads, it, it's, it's a challenging technical um, issue for them to work with. And so kind of coaxed Philip to come back after a few weeks. And so we started doing some investigations. Well, like, how are other people using piezo pads? What can we learn? And so we spent a lot of time like looking for videos on YouTube because piezo pads, they're not my expertise either. And you know, we can only get certain engineers out at the club every you know, once in a while, it's not like they're there every week with us. So what they ended up deciding was that, you know, there is nothing out there on YouTube because they wanted video, they really wanted to see how this worked, that would teach us about piezo pads. So they decided to put that project aside and they ended up spending a few weeks making their own short YouTube clip on just exactly what piezo pads are and how you might use them. So yeah, they were not at all successful. They did not make their light up backpack from that vantage point. But with some coaxing and getting them back, they did end up making a short video that was by kids for kids teaching about piezo pads. So I would call that, you know, successful. Um, what, what, was a, um, what pushed them away initially, that the technical challenge that they picked was really hard, that they wanted to make something that ultimately um, ended up being too hard for them to do. For, for other kids, you know, the challenge is really social. Like, you're asking me to come to this makerspace thing and be here for at least one day a week, hopefully a couple days a week, over months, when I could be in the games room with my friends, when I could be in the gym playing basketball, or where I could just be, you know, chilling or whatever in the team room. And that, that's actually a real challenge. And so thinking through different strategies that we can employ that help young people to um, create movement, um, really fluid movement between these spaces, I think, is also one way in which we do support young people in um, creating time and space to, or making the time and space to be in the, um, to be in the maker space. But yeah, there are some young people who start and, and leave the program, and we can't ever quite figure out what would help them come back. Um, you know, there are young people who I would argue don't, who would say, I, I, I should put this, I should have put this quote up there. They would say, I am not a scientist, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a STEM person, but I do community science. And in fact, if you noticed, I could flip back to, um, to Fall's pivot, pivot, um, critical moments. She... Uh, and another one of her friends came up with the term fiance because they don't like science at all. They only like fiance, which is F-C-I-E-N-C-E. -C -E -E. Because for them that captured, so okay, that's the contraction of fun plus science. But in, the, in a follow-up interview where we got them to really unpack what fiance was, actually it wasn't, I mean, fun is important. Like I'm having fun, I'm laughing, I'm feeling good. But it was also like it was doing something that mattered. Like it, that was the bottom line for them. I want to do something that matters. I don't want to do that straw experiment because it doesn't matter. I want to do something that matters. And so maybe it means making a video. Maybe it means um, building a little free library. And for, her, for fall, this is really interesting in terms of um, your question earlier, Harold. She was in our Get City program for a couple years and then Get City kind of ended, and then we did this other thing, and she didn't really come back to that. And then she started coming back, honestly, because she was interested in the snack. And she said it, I want snack, I'm here for snack. I'm like, okay, well, why don't you stay? You can help out, you're an expert, you're a Get City graduate, come stay. So she stayed, she didn't really help out, she just sort of stayed and watched. 
And she started writing, because we have a, a blog, she just started writing these blog posts. And then she began to be identified by others as the blogger. Fall, write that in the blog this week. Fall, get a picture of this. And then if you actually trace, and you can do this, you can go get City, and trace her blog posts, you'll notice that um, actually her accounts are pretty ethnographic in nature, which is really interesting. But you'll notice after a while, she then starts to put pictures of herself actually blogging. Because it took that long for her to begin to see herself as that blogger. And so for me, it kind of raises the question of like, what kinds of spaces are we creating for young people? Like, what wide range of spaces are we creating for young people in these after school programs so that they feel like they belong? For Fall, she did not want to do some of the STEM work. For her, she blogged for a long time before then finally like, oh, I think I can do this making project now. I think I'll make this little free library. So in a way she became that community's resource. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know who should I call on. You call on somebody. You, uh, uh, right. Oh, I didn't see the hand up first. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, hi. Thank you so much for your share. Um, if I was to create a maker space, what sort of things what I do is since arrived, like, can you speak to the logistics of what you did? Do you have any grades from the paper? Oh, wow, yeah, that's a great question and very hard question to answer. So um, we, I, I don't know, I'm not going to give you a great answer, but I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to try to give you an answer. Because one of the things that we're trying to figure out with this project is, like, what are the core design principles for an equity-oriented community-based makerspace? And it's really important that I say community-based makerspace. So I'm not talking about a makerspace in, like, a making studio where you have to pay membership, or in a library, or in a museum or a museum where you might have to pay an admission fee to get in, or in a library, which is more likely to be more sort of drop-in for a couple hours. But in a community center where kids are hanging out already and are more likely to have sustained engagement. And so we have thought a lot about um, what kinds of experiences would you engage young people in to orient them to the space and to ways of being in this space that support who they are and what they might do. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things we do when we start the school year, because we do run it like a program, is we just engage in a lot of dialogue and ethnography, youth as community ethnographers, around what issues people care about. But we also think about literally the physical design of the space, because we're, we are actually now moving into a semi-permanent room that will be ours. Like, what do they want this space to feel like and to look like? And so um, we involved a, a, youth, a group of 15 youth in a participatory design um, action research project last summer where we went and visited lots of different maker spaces around Michigan. We took virtual tours of other spaces um, that we couldn't afford to visit because, you know, they're in California or elsewhere that were, that were geared towards youth um, and that had sustained programming. Um, although some of the ones we visited were meant for adults because they were on MSU's campus and so forth. And what was so interesting to us was a couple different things. One of the things was that they really pointed towards um, what they didn't want about what they visited. Like these spaces are not for us because we don't feel welcome because they're not colorful and bright. We can't touch everything. We don't have a space to think and to work it out. We, um, we want to um, be able to do these other things, and we don't see that stuff there. So for example, now in designing the, the space that we have now, they're very adamant that we have in the corner of the room like comfy chair and bean bags, which you might imagine, but they also want a dance floor with a disco ball on top. Because when you get frustrated, the only option right now is to leave the room, go down the hall and play basketball, and maybe come back. But then you're going to be so enticed by your peer relations that you're probably not going to come back unless you have that really great mentor, Danny, who's going to play basketball with you and bring you back. And so this will allow them to get their frustrations out. And that all started because we were working in a university room and we couldn't really, um, during our summer program, and when you couldn't really go storming out of that room. So we were just like, stop, dance time. And that was started by the kids, like dance break, and we had dance break. So we're having a little dance floor in the corner. Um, yeah, I don't know about that. I was going to say, I don't know about 
But they, al they also want a snack station because they've been in school all day and when you're working you need to feed the brain. So there has to be a snack station. But um, they also, this is really, this was so interesting to me. So they, uh, they wanted a thinking station. They wanted a rough draft station and a make it perfect station and a presentation station. But they were very clear that tied to the rough draft station, they wanted to be able to have rough drafts showcased in that space, um, like hanging up, like I want my rough draft hanging up on the wall so that when other people come in, they will see that what you do in here doesn't have to be perfect. Because they were really uh, intimidated, I would say, by visiting other spaces and seeing like really cool, perfect stuff hanging up. And they did not want that other people to have those same feelings. I thought that was a really cool idea. Yeah, I see we're on both of the day out of time. Well then, uh, do you have a question? Uh, oh, I can ask her. Yeah, maybe yeah. after, if that's okay, just because it's 7 o'clock. And so I want to respect the time. And thank you so much for this excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, you can say, yeah, I have a little gift for you, so just wait right there, I'll give it to you. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Harold Levine, and I'm Dean of the School of Education, um, and uh, thank you, Angie, for oh, your thank talk. You very much. Um, for those of you who are um, in education, many of you I know are in the room, uh, have been at the annual conference of the American Educational Research Association this past uh, April in uh, D.C., and the, th the, uh, the theme for the annual conference uh, was engaged scholarship. And we spent days, and I, I actually went to a whole day session with, for deans about, well, what is engaged scholarship? How are you doing it? Can you do it better? And we've had all kinds of examples and struggling for a definition, which of course is not possible, but about what engaged scholarship is. So um, um, I'm going to recommend that all those deans come and talk to you. <laughs> because this is a wonderful, I mean, uh, participatory action research, the kind of work that you do, is, is, is just, you know, inherently um, engaged scholarship. And the idea of, I mean, a, a lot of engaged scholarship is really trying to minimize, not to ignore, but to minimize the difference between an expert and a novice, or a researcher and, or a researcher and, its, and his or her subject, uh, the observer and the observed. And this is really the work that you're doing is a really kind of, is really taking this idea of co-construction, I mean the co-construction of knowledge is a, um, it is what engaged scholarship for many people really is all about. And then, and you are sharing your knowledge, you are an expert, but you're allowing the kids also to, to be experts in their own way and to develop that grow, and, and grow that expertise. And, and it's a notion of co-construction, I think, is so important to that, this one strand of engaged scholarship. And um, I think there's a, a lot to learn. I mean, there's so much we're trying to teach people, and yet there's so much that they can also teach us and create on their own. So I want to applaud you for this kind of work. I'm, I'm going to make sure everybody in AERA is at your doorstep <laughs> and uh, trying to learn more. Um, uh, I also think, and I, I'll, I'll almost close with this, you talked about safe and unsafe spaces, and I, you know, I have the feeling that for many kids, school is an unsafe place, and it gets sort of, I think, back to, to Carrie's question, too. And I think a big question is, how do, how do we engage students, and that was the basis of my question, how do we engage students in an after-school space, but how do we engage them and make classrooms safe? for them, and I know there are teachers out there who do that, and some of our faculty here try to work with teachers to make that happen, but how do you do it on a, on a national level? So, and I would bet you have a lot more to tell us about that next time we have you out. So let me thank you all for coming. I have a small um, gift for you, so among other things that is cool at UC Davis, there's many cool things, we also make olive oil, Ooh, and so, um, if you have a, like a hand carry, uh, we'll yeah. ship it to you. But if you can slip it in your luggage and take it home, next time you have your pasta at home, think of us. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. And have a good evening.